Hi, and thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Jordan Rudder, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you miss them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send out to registrants and on our website. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box, and we'll try to answer as many of those during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentations. We'll also be answering some of the questions in the Q&A box during the presentations. Automated captions are available for this webinar, and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and clicking on show subtitles. You can also drag them wherever you want on the screen then. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, which was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. Bird conservation works. Species and groups of birds have rebounded in the past decades, but it doesn't happen without people like you who care about birds. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. One of the most common bird experiences and programs that we've been working on for years is one of the biggest threats to virtually every species in the Americas and around the world, collisions. Many, if not most of you, have probably heard that heart dropping thud at your window or seen a bird lying on the ground next to a building. Birds collide with glass because they see the world differently than people do. <laughs> when you think about it, glass isn't natural and birds aren't exactly incorporating windows into their nests. <laughs> so it's up to us to help. ABC has been working on this issue for years and our team of experts are leading on solutions that everyone can take action on. From architects and glass manuf manufacturers to homeowners and even kids. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our expert speakers. Dr. Christine Shepard has been director of ABC's Glass Collisions Program since its inception in 2009. Her first job was in the Wildlife Conservation Society's Bronx Zoo Bird Department, where she started as curat curatorial intern and edit ended up as curator and chair of the ornithology department. She has led instrumental bird collision mitigation efforts, including testing of materials, the publication of the bird-friendly building design, lead pilot credit 55, bird collision deterrence, and consulting on related legislation throughout the US. Aniko Totha is coordinator for ABC's bird collisions glass testing program. She previously worked as a keeper in the Department of Ornithology at the Wildlife Conservation Society's Bronx Zoo, overseeing one of the most diverse collections of birds in the world. Her field work experience includes research with seabirds off the coast of California, a passerine stopover ecology study in the Meadowlands of New Jersey, and the bird collisions glass testing tunnel in Bronx, New York. Dr. Brian Lenz is ABC's glass collisions campaign manager and Bird City America's director. He joined ABC after working as the director of community conservation program, Bird City, Wisconsin, and chief scientist at the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory. Brian birdwatched his way through primatology fieldwork in Belize, Peru, Costa Rica, and his dissertation in Brazil before officially switching his career path from monkeys to birds. He is interested in using education, research, design, technology, and legislation to reduce threats to birds and build greener communities. Chris is gonna start things off now by sharing more about this issue at large and background information. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Sorry, trying to get organized. Before we start, I want to make sure that we all know what we're talking about. There are two things that, that people sometimes confuse um, as collisions. One is territorial aggression, which we see at this time of year. Um, male birds, especially birds like robins and cardinals, will attack their reflections in windows. They don't usually hurt themselves doing this. Um, they can be an incredible nuisance um, and it's difficult to stop them. Um, you have to eliminate their view of the reflection 
And the solutions that work to stop other kinds of collisions don't necessarily stop this kind of behavior. What we're talking about is when birds fly at full speed right into glass um, as if it were habitat that they could sail through. Um, this causes uh, death, it causes injury. Um, birds in general don't um, come out of a collision unscathed. Why is this a problem? As many as a billion birds a year are killed this way in the US alone. The only thing worse is outdoor cats. So please keep your kitty indoors. It's better for the cat, it's better for wildlife, um, and it's actually better for you. Do we need birds? I'm pretty sure that everybody who's listening now um, knows that we need birds, but lots and lots of people don't. So, you know, the first thing that, that we can all do to help birds is try to explain to people who, who don't know about them why they're important. Not just that they have intrinsic value or cultural value, um, but selfishly, because they contribute hundreds of billions in eco services um, that, that we need. Um, when California fires um, burn habitat to the ground, it's birds that bring seeds back in so that plants will grow again. Um, birds love to eat insects and they eat the kinds of insects that could give you West Nile virus um, that might destroy your crops. Um, that might actually uh, ruin your forest. Bird watching um, is an enormous industry at this point. Birds have a really big constituency. Um, and all of those bird watchers create lots and lots of jobs and everything from uh, bed and breakfast um, to the heavy equipment these guys carry around to the trendy clothes that they wear. So there's a lot riding on birds and it's important that we protect them. What do we need to know to stop this? Well, the fact is that we actually now already, we know all we need to know to stop collisions. What we have to do is get people to actually put that knowledge into practice. We know that collisions aren't rare. Um, Jordan mentioned, you know, almost everybody has seen or heard a bird hit a window. Most people though think this is rare. They don't really think about how often this has to happen for everyone to have the same experience. Why don't we see more carcasses is one of the most frequent questions I get asked. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Birds can bounce off glass and land in foundation plantings or uh, wind up in a grate. Um, birds are often swept up with the trash first thing in the morning if they've hit a building. Um, but primarily it's because scavengers are very efficient. There are lots of scavenger type critters, um, including everything from those house cats to rats to raccoons coons, crows, um, and all of them think that a, a nice juicy bird is a tremendous snack. Um, so they will actually stake out uh, windows that cause a lot of collisions. Um, and because of this, um, if we're trying to study collisions, one of the things we have to do is watch and see how long carcasses will persist so we can see how accurate our numbers are. The majority of birds that are killed by collisions with glass are songbirds. That doesn't mean that almost every kind of bird out there hasn't hit a window at some time or other, but most of the birds that collide are warblers and sparrows and thrushes. Um, and these are birds that migrate twice a year between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds. So they're running the gamut of North America basically twice a year. This gives rise to some confusion because most of these birds actually migrate at night um, but most collisions take place at, during the day. So the birds aren't flying into buildings at night. Um, they're running into windows um, once the sun comes up. Which buildings are the most dangerous? Um, there tends to be an association between collisions and high rise buildings. But in fact, almost half of collisions take place on homes and other buildings that are maybe up to about three stories. Almost all of the rest of collisions take place on buildings um, up to about 11 stories, what we call low rise buildings. It doesn't mean that skyscrapers don't cause collisions, they do. But most of the collisions on skyscrapers happen in those first 11 floors. Um, what's happening here is the same, it's the same thing that um, explains why most 
car accidents takes within 15 miles of home. It's because that's where you do all your driving. Well, birds spend most of their time in vegetation looking for food. That's where shelter is and so forth. Um, and it's the glass that reflects vegetation that's the most dangerous to birds that causes the most collisions. People can't actually see glass. Now, this surprises a lot of people. Um, people are injured all the time bumping into glass. We learn about glass as a concept when we're very young, um, but we can't see it any better um, than birds can. Birds unfortunately never learn the concept um, of glass as a transparent barrier or a barrier that can reflect reality. If I take the cues away that you use, you can't tell me if this is a picture of a tree or if this is a tree seen through a window or if this is the reflection of a tree. When I show you a bit more information, you know that glass has to be involved here. Um, only when I show you this picture, do you understand it's a reflection. We know that right angles aren't part of nature. Um, we know that the air doesn't have cracks in it. Birds can't use any of those cues. So they take what they see literally. Um, each of the trees in this photograph um, to a bird is a legitimate destination to, to fly to. Now, it helps to know a little bit more about how birds see the world um, and how that differs from how we see the world. Uh, we're primates. We've got eyes um, that are close together um, in a relatively flat face. We don't have a beak sticking out between our eyes. Um, we see more or less the same thing with each eye, which gives us good depth perception or three-dimensional vision. We tend to see the world as something that's in front of us. People are always saying, watch where you're going. Now, birds have eyes on the sides of their heads. So first of all, they don't see the same thing with each eye. Um, I have a hard time imagining that myself. Um, they do have to deal with that beak. They don't have very good 3D vision. They use other kinds of mechanisms to tell how fast they're going, when they're going to arrive somewhere. And presumably, they experience the world as something they're immersed in. Their most accurate vision is out to the side um, and they're watching behind them to make sure that predators aren't coming after them. So my model of a bird that's flying through the air, um, thinking that open skies are ahead is actually a kid texting on a skateboard, um, which I've seen, but never been able to get on photo in a photograph. Um, so this guy texting on a hoverboard is the best I've been able to do with that. So what makes glass bird friendly? How do we fix this? What we do is we use visual cues um, that basically give a message to the bird. Don't fly through here. You can't fly through here. We use visual markers and we space them so that birds think that they can't keep flying, that there's a barrier there. Birds know very well how big their bodies are, how wide their wings are. Um, and the guidelines that we've created are based on the body dimensions of some of the smallest birds that collide with glass. If we make glass safe for chickadees and black and white warblers and hummingbirds, we can make glass safe for all the bigger birds that are at risk too. What that means is visual markers shouldn't be more than about two inches apart. Um, this is especially important because hummingbirds um, are, as we know, small birds, um, and they're one of the most frequent uh, type of bird that collides with windows. The markers have to be visible to the birds. So if you're using a line, um, and it could be something that you draw on glass, it could be a piece of tape that you put on glass, it could actually be a, a piece of rope that you dangle in front of glass, it should be at least an eighth of an inch in width to make sure that birds can see it. If you're using a dot, so if you're you know, putting paint on your window or you're putting a decal, it needs to be at least a quarter inch in diameter so that birds can see it. So what's a bird-friendly building? Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this because the focus of this particular seminar is what you can do um, at home. But it's useful to know, especially when you're talking to your friends, um, the building on the left is clearly not bird friendly. Um, you can't tell the reflections from the actual trees. I do a lot of classes for architects in bird friendly design. And I know when I 
first enter the room, that that photograph on the right is what they think I'm going to tell them to do. No glass, you know, create bunkers. And luckily that's not true. You can have almost any kind of building and make it bird friendly relatively easily. So bird friendly design isn't an add-on. It should be part of just regular design. It's something that you should be thinking of from the very beginning. There's lots and lots of different ways to do it. Um, and you can have very attractive buildings. Um, and there are many, many buildings out there um, that are bird friendly that weren't designed that way intentionally. So if you want to build a bird friendly glass box, you can. Um, this is Intuit headquarters if you're doing your taxes right now. Um, in Mountain View, California, Mountain View is a community that requires bird friendly design. Um, the architects here chose a glass that has a narrow horizontal stripe, which means that you can see out just fine. Um, from the parking lot, you really can't even tell um, that this pattern is on the glass. But if you're a bird and you get within maybe six to 10 feet of the glass, you see those lines and you think, I can't go through that. I'm going to change direction. Um, this is a building um, at the University of Vancouver. Uh, the glass here has a, a vertical stripe, um, which can also be highly effective. These stripes also serve to reduce the amount of, of glare, of light and glare that come into internal surfaces or to diffuse it. Some bird friendly buildings are in fact weird looking. Um, this is a building that was not designed for birds intentionally, um, but that green structure, um, which is actually made of glass, is the sunshade. There's lots and lots of overlap between strategies for controlling heat and light and strategies for making glass bird friendly. Now you can see here from any given angle, only a little bit of that glass is visible. So if you're a bird flying along that building, um, it might actually even look as if the, the glass is sort of uh, in motion, um, but it's, it's not um, that's going to have a strong reflection that you're going to try to fly to. This is a really interesting kind of glass called dot view. Um, from the outside, it can have a, a non-shiny surface. Um, you can actually put graphics on it, um, as here with uh, this quote from Martin Luther King. But from the inside, um, because the surface is actually made of dots, you can see out very well. So you don't have to sacrifice your view to make your glass bird friendly. You can also print on the outside surface of glass where reflections can't make it invisible. Um, and there are a number of companies that are able to print pretty much anything you can think of. I mean, look at this um, on the outside of glass to make buildings bird friendly. Again, this was not intended to be a bird friendly building when it was designed, um, but it has a couple of different bird friendly features. But so what if you already have a building? Um, what do you do? I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Aniko, and she's going to tell you. Thanks so much, Chris. So as Aniko gets set up, um, she's going to teach us about DIY and at-home solutions. So take it away. All right. Thanks, Jordan. Let's see here. Perfect. Okay. So now that Dr. Shepard went over why collisions happen, where they happen. Oops, let me change this for you. Uh, what can you do at home? That's why we're here. We want to know what everybody can do in their own homes. So the good news is, if you have a home that has external insect screens, you're already there. Insect screens are really considered bird friendly. You can see in this first image here that there's an insect screen on the left hand side and there's nothing on the right hand side. Insect screens do a really great job at diffusing reflection, which is typically what causes the confusion of birds and causes them to fly into windows. So that's a really great way to keep bugs out and keep birds from hitting your windows. And also if they do end up hitting a window for some other reason, it can kind of lessen the blow a little bit and it won't, won't be lethal to the bird. And in the right hand side picture here, we just have a cat uh, enjoying from the inside the window film that's on the outside of the glass. 
So in the next few slides, we're just gonna go over uh, a few options you can do at home. Uh, some of these are DIY, some can be uh, professionally installed, uh, but a lot of them are cost-effective, um, you know, friendlier to the pocket, and some can be a little more expensive, but we'll just start from the beginning here. So a really great option is super easy to get, paint. You can paint your windows from the outside. So you can use tempera paint if you need it to be a little um, less uh, long lasting and then acrylic will obviously last a longer time. Tempera is easier to remove, but you could have fun with this. If you're creative, not like me, then you can do these really beautiful intricate designs on the outside of your glass. Uh, you really just have to think about spacing here what Dr. Shepard was mentioning before. So as long as the birds can't think that they can fly through whatever gaps you, you have on your, on your um, paint on the windows, uh, it should be bird friendly. So really beautiful designs here. And you can be really simple with it as well. Just simple lines or a fish. That's probably something I would do because again, I have zero creativity. Or you could have fun with your family and do some uh, more festive windows and you could change it every season, fall, spring, during Christmas time or the holidays and just a really uh, nice way to make your windows more bird friendly. So the North Carolina Zoo actually used a stencil roller, which is a great way to use paint where it will look more uniform and a little more professional. And then you won't have to worry about spacing at all as long as that stencil roller has the spacing you require to make your windows bird friendly. It's really easy to apply. So another great product to use is American Bird Conservancy's bird tape. So it's essentially like a scotch tape. It's a frosted tape and it comes in either a roll or in squares and you can apply it to the outside of your glass uh, in any way you want, as long as you're keeping spacing in mind. Uh, it can be on a diagonal, straight, horizontal. Uh, you could do a fun giraffe or just these great squares. Uh, they can last a few seasons. They're also really easy to remove. So in a pinch, this is a really great way to make your windows bird friendly. So another thing that we get asked about quite frequently still is decals. Uh, do decals work? Decals do work, but you can't just slap one bird silhouette on the middle of your window and expect birds not to try to fly around it and still crash into your windows. So if you are using decals, they have to be spaced appropriately, two, inches, two by two inches apart, on the outside of your glass. You can see in this middle picture here. Uh, that they used a bunch of different fun decals that are spaced appropriately so no bird is going to try to squeeze through these uh, crevices through the decals. And honestly, you can use any color you want on the outside of your glass. You can see on the left hand side photo here that they used a great bird silhouette in multiple different colors and it's pretty attractive. Uh, I know that there's something called a cricket out there, which is a vinyl printer that my friends have been playing around with and they've been making their own decals on their windows, making their own designs, and they've been having a lot of fun with that. So something that's a little more expensive and you can have professionally installed or uh, do it yourself if you're really motivated, would be Acopian bird savers. So Acopian bird savers are paracords spaced appropriately apart and they're mounted on top of your windows and they can just dangle down. They can either be mounted on the bottom as well or you can leave them loose if you don't live in a, a particularly windy area. And they also go by the name Zen wind curtains because they can add some Zen to your life when they're drifting in the breeze. So you can see here that they really don't take over your view outside at all, that they end up just blending in with the background. Another option is bird crash preventers. Uh, very similar to the uh, Acopian bird savers idea, except this isn't a paracord, it's a monofilament or fishing line. And this is mounted at the top of the bottom of your outside of your window with the proper spacing. And although not as effective as uh, the birds, uh, Acopian bird savers, it does work very well. Uh, the bird savers uh, paracords are just a little bit uh, more bold and the birds can pick that up better. But this works very well and can also last a long time. So Easy Up Shades is another great product. It's really a fabric that you can suction cut to the outside of your window. It diffuses reflection completely, so the birds won't crash into your windows. And it can also keep the inside of your home at the optimal temperature you want, keep the sun out. Bird Screen is another great way to um, 
keep birds from hitting your windows. It will diffuse the reflection like I showed you in that first image there with the insect screening, except this is easily removed. You can roll it up when you don't want to use it, but you can see here that it won't impinge on your view at all. So now we're going to move into something that's a little more complicated, window film. And if you're confident and motivated, you can absolutely apply, apply window film yourself. Uh, or you can hire a professional to do it. I know even window washers can do it for you. But they can be really simple or really great designs as well. These that we're looking at here are just the simple uh, horizontal and vertical lines, as long as that, that line is an eighth of an inch spaced two, two inches apart, it's going to work very, very well. Feather Friendly is a window film company uh, that is available commercially as well as residentially. They offer an array of really great, beautiful, attractive patterns. This is their simple dot pattern. They're about a quarter inches in diameter and they're spaced two inches apart. And you can see that they're really effective on the outside of the glass here. The birds are going to perceive them well and not collide with the glass. But from the inside looking out, you can see that it just blends in with the background and it doesn't impinge on your view at all. There's also Kaleidoscape, which has a lot of different colors that they offer in their acrylic window film. ABC likes to use white. We find that it diffuses the reflection the most. Um, it can last a long time, just like the Feather Friendly. Both of these can last up to 10 years outside on the outside of your window. And they're actually a really great way to keep the optimal temperatures inside as well, because they too, do offer shading for the inside, while you can still look outside like there's no, no barrier there at all. External motorized shades are a little more expensive, but very effective to stop collisions. These would have to be professionally installed, uh, but if you put them down at nighttime and pick them up later in the morning, you're going to stop a, a really high majority of collisions that would be happening in your home, since a lot of them happen at dawn. It does happen all day and at night, but more typically it's during the morning when the birds are, are becoming active again. So if you close your shades at night, not only are you helping with the heating and cooling of your home, but you'll be decreasing the chance of bird collisions as well. And you can see in this building on the right that they uh, did motor uh, these motorized shades for every apartment in the building to cut down on heating and cooling costs. So netting is also a bit more tricky, but a great alternative to making your home more bird friendly. But if you decide to go with netting, it has to be taught and you have to check the integrity of the netting daily. If there's any tears or if it's not taught, you can uh, unintentionally harm wildlife or wild birds. Something can get taught in it, uh, caught in it. And also keep in mind that the diameter of the netting can't be any more than one inch, because if it's any bigger than that, the birds will try to squeeze through or get tangled. So those are just a few ideas you can use at home. Uh, they're all retrofits you can find on our website at birdsmartglass.org. Uh, we have links to all of these products online. Uh, and also you'll be able to find this flyer there. It's basically a Collisions 101 flyer. Uh, of great ideas you can hand out to your friends, print it out, send it an email, but spread the word that it can be really easy to make your home more bird friendly. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aniko. So friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded. And uh, if you didn't get that link or need more information, check out our website and we'll follow up with an email to all the registrants. But now we're gonna hear from Brian, who's going to share how you can take some of this to your community and beyond. Thank you, Jordan, Aniko, and Chris. Um, so we're gonna take some of what Chris and Aniko just talked about um, and show you how you can put it into place in your community. Um, there's really two targets when you're looking at this. Um, you have to fix the existing buildings and uh, make sure that the new buildings are built correctly. Uh, it's easy to think you can just focus on the new buildings, but if we built every new building to be bird friendly starting today, um, we'd still lose up to a billion birds a year in the US until we have replaced every piece of glass. Um, so we really need to um, work on both approaches here. Um, in terms of fixing the existing buildings, uh, our goal is to fix the really bad windows and leave the rest. We would love anybody who would be interested in doing all of the windows because all windows can cause collisions but being pragmatic, realizing that there are costs and effort and 
involved with putting up a, a retrofit. Um, you know, we hope that people will isolate the bad windows and fix them. Um, there are a number of steps we talk about for this process. The first is doing lights out. Um, that is turning your lights off overnight during spring and fall migration. So from midnight to you know 7 a.m., um, have the lights off. And if you do use outdoor lights, they should be shielded so it doesn't go up into the sky. Uh, it saves energy and it won't directly prevent window collisions with your windows, but it will make it less likely that birds are spending a whole lot of time um, next to next to the building. Then for the, the steps to take for the building, um, step two is to pay attention. This is basically monitoring. Um, so this is you coming up with a list of what your problem windows are. Uh, right off the bat, you can plan to apply a retrofit to any, any window where you've heard a collision before. Um, you, I can guarantee you, you haven't heard all of them and that there will be more in the future. And then also any window that is across from a bird feeder or a bird bath or a popular fruiting tree in your yard. Um, those are all windows that experience collisions. So they, they need a solution. Uh, step three would be plan. So you figure out which of the solutions Aniko talked about um, or other solutions that we have on our website that you like the best. Uh, step four, you install it. And then on step five, you go back to step two. You've got your worst windows treated, you pay attention. The next time you hear a bird hit a window, you put something on that window. And pretty soon you'll have done a handful of your windows and you will have gotten rid of almost the entire collision problem at your home. Uh, just to point out quickly on the bottom, the, this is not a glass or lights situation. Um, really, you should do both. And if you're gonna pick one or the other, you should pick the glass 100% of the time. Um, Cause you can have a great, lighting policy lights off all shielded and birds are still going to hit your windows all day. Um, so make sure you do the glass if you're going to choose one of the two. Uh, a quick note on that monitoring piece. If you're considering thinking about larger buildings or a larger number of buildings, um, it can be a bit more involved to get the monitoring data correct. Uh, this is a project we did with Northwestern University in Chicago and the Chicago bird collision monitors. And we had the monitors record where section by section they were picking up the dead birds as they did their monitoring. Um, and this let us focus in on what the bad problems were, like what are the worst sections of these buildings? And you can see the middle building there, the Allen Center, uh, there's that one little bump out in the middle that causes almost half of the collisions and is probably 5% of the building. So if you're looking at this with a fixed amount of money, say you've got half a million dollars to spend on retrofits, instead of doing all of one of those buildings, if you record your data this way, you can get the worst parts of most buildings and save more birds than just doing all of one building. When it comes to getting a retrofit put into place, you are gonna have to be the advocate for that retrofit to be um, installed. If it's your property, congrats, you're done. I assume by the fact that you're here, you're interested in collisions and interested in taking action um, and you own, own the property so you can put it up or, or rent property. Um, if it's not your property, that is where you need to kind of start thinking about strategy. Uh, we have created a guide um, for some things to think about in how you would make this kind of an approach. Um, and one of the things I wanna highlight from that guide, there's more in it than this, um, but is to always remember what the owner of the building already knows. And in most cases, they will never have thought about bird conservation. They will never have thought about the serious threat that bird collisions are. They won't know that it kills up to a billion birds and they probably won't have any idea that their building is killing birds. So you need to go in as a friend who is offering education, offering knowledge and offering to help them make a positive change. Um, if it's accusatory or um, kind of aggressive, you're gonna lose that person right away. And it's not illegal to have a building that kills birds. Um, so you're basically asking them a favor. When it comes to looking at new construction, pretty often people come to us um, and to other collisions experts and want to do a single building. 
Um, and one building at a time is really too time consuming. Um, remember, we're trying to save a billion birds a year. And if um, all we did was building by building, um, we would probably do, you know, <laughs> 250 buildings and then retire in 20 years. And that's not going to save a billion birds. However, building by building still can be valuable. Um, I worked with the Milwaukee Bucks on their Fiserv forum in the NBA arena, and that got the lead credit and is the first bird friendly uh, uh, sports stadium. And there was all kinds of press and PR that came out of it. And it was a really a great thing and a great experience. But from the day I sent the first letter about the process to the time we announced it, it was over three years. So you can see how much time this can take. And this was with um, a group that was pretty clearly interested in talking to me from the beginning, which is not always the case. So if you do decide to go after a single building, um, even though we're in favor of going after multiple buildings, um, you will want to build a coalition. So you find other people who agree that that building should be bird friendly, whether it's new construction or actually a retrofit. Um, and make sure that the people who are building or owning the building know that there are a lot of people that would like to see this happen, especially if there are tenants for the building. Um, you can think about how you make your approach. A single voice or a single organization being the lead is often useful. Uh, it's not confusing for the, the building owner because there is one person they know they should have their interchange with. Um, it also helps you control the messaging a little. That said, there are times when you do want multiple organizations at the table, which is also fine. It's just something to make sure you think about, um, because if you have a meeting where there is 15 of you and two of them, they might feel a little overwhelmed. Um, you also need to go into these knowing your ask. So if you say build a bird friendly building, you should be able to tell them what that means, because they are probably not going to have any idea. And then lastly, it's underlined is patience and persistence. You know, I mentioned the Milwaukee Bucks process was a three year deal. Um, so you more or less have to be a likable pain in the butt. Uh, you can't call them, you know, every other day or expect an immediate reply to your email, but you have to kind of just keep not going away because you're not their number one priority. Now, if you're gonna decide to go bigger and target multiple buildings through an ordinance or some guidelines, the steps are really the same except you might need to get an elected official on your side and you know do a bit of different coalition building and advocacy. But the theory behind it is basically the same. You're there to do education and um, share with people how they can do something positive. In terms of coming up with the actual laws or the guidelines, there's kind of two ways you can get these targets of multiple buildings put into place. The first is to adopt a policy without a law. Um, you can think of this as being something that would happen at a university, a parks department, businesses, you know, et cetera. Um, you don't need to do any legislation. You just need to get the people who are in charge to say, we want to do this. Um, there are architecture firms that do the same um, thing. A good example of this is the South Korean Ministry of Environment, who Dr. Shepard has been working with for a number of years. Uh, they have transparent noise barriers along their roadways, which, as you might imagine, cause a lot of collisions. And they have put up retrofits on all that are up and are going to be making all of them going forward bird friendly. And they have found this to be such a good success story that they are also looking for other places where they might be able to incorporate bird friendly design and they didn't pass a law. The second pathway is again to pass an ordinance or a law. Um, ABC has created a whole page of our website dedicated to helping people have the tools to be able to do this. Um, we have a model ordinance there. Um, the model ordinance, if you enacted it as it's written, you would have the most strict bird friendly building guidelines ever enacted. And we don't expect that, but we want to set the bar high. So we do provide guidance for how you can walk that back a little bit to make it fit for your community. Um, the model ordinance is good because it has a definition section, which makes sure you're going to include the right types of features and language. It also includes renovations. Um, there are a lot of buildings that because the windows have failed or because they are looking to have more efficient operations to reduce CO2 emissions, they replace their windows and you need a permit to do that. And so that is a, one pathway to get at 
fixing all of the existing glass is that if your ordinance includes building renovations that replace glass, um, the, this law should be triggered. We also review um, the existing ordinances and say, you know, kind of a good, better, best kind of ranking of them. So if you want to start with an existing ordinance that is on the book somewhere, you kind of know where we think you would be better off starting. Um, and then tips to build support and some specific tools for um, the LEED credit system and New York City's guidelines, which specifically reference ABC. Um, there are a number of mandatory ordinances that have been passed. These are all in North America. Um, New York City is highlighted because they, at the moment, have hands down the most comprehensive policy. Um, it requires that 90% of the glass in the first 75 feet above the ground on every building be bird friendly, um, which is, is pretty darn good. Um, there are a couple more that need to be added to this list as an update. So if you are in a community that has one um, that is not on here, feel free to reach out. There are a couple that will be added next time. And lastly, on the bottom, um, I wanted to just quickly mention voluntary guidelines. There are a number of communities that are not listed here that have adopted voluntary bird-friendly building guidelines. And at ABC, we, um, we appreciate the effort that goes into that, but we really prefer that they are required guidelines because we think that um, the voluntary guidelines take a lot of time and effort to get um, put in place, and then they don't really get used once they're in place. And the community then thinks that they have done a good thing, which their intentions were terrific, um, but it's not saving the birds we'd like to see saved. So we really push for um, mandatory when possible. And I would like you to, um, I'd like to invite you to visit our site. All of the links that we talked about today can be reached by typing in birdsmartglass.org. Um, if you have specific questions, you can email the three presenters today. And if you are not already an ABC member, I would like to invite you to become one. We couldn't do what we do without our members and our donors. So thank you all for being interested enough to join today. Um, and I challenge you to go home and retrofit at least one window. Thanks so much, Dr. Lenz. We're now going to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if I can invite all of our speakers to turn their videos on. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to get through all of the questions. We've had such an incredible and engaged audience. Um, so friendly reminder, you're gonna get links to all of the resources in a follow-up email if you registered, and it's always on our website, abcbirds.org. But we're gonna kick it off with a few uh, questions that did come in during registration, just while I get set up for the ones that are live. So Chris, can you share how ABC evaluates the effectiveness of solutions for this issue? Well, we use any kind of information we can get our hands on. Um, so uh, in some cases, this includes uh, places where buildings have been monitored and then the glass has been remedied and monitoring has taken place again. So we see how much of a decrease um, in collisions is associated with that material. Um, ABC has a contraption called a glass testing tunnel, um, which we've been using since 2010, um, primarily to evaluate uh, commercial glass types, um, but we've also been able to, to use it um, to evaluate some of the retrofits that we talked about today. Um, and Basically, it's a it's not injurious. Um, the tunnels are based at bird banding stations um, for birds that have been netted um, and weighed and measured and sexed and aged. Um, will come out um, and we'll put them in this thing that we call the tunnel. Um, the birds, to them, it appears as though they've got two ways out. One looks as though there's nothing there. The other is whatever we're testing. And the more birds fly towards the apparently empty space, the more we think they're avoiding the thing that we're testing. Um, and this can get very complicated, so I'm not going to go into it in more detail than that, but we do have photographs and videos of this on the website. And as a teaser, we put out some very exciting news just today about it, so make sure you check out our website for more. So I'm just moving quickly again, because we have so many great questions we want to get through. Um, 
And Nico, the next one is for you. Obviously, this is a huge emotional issue, especially when you find a bird that has hit a window. And folks are asking, what do you do for the bird? Um, we're going to talk more about the glass to prevent collisions, but what can what can people do when they actually find an injured bird? If you if you find a stunned bird that doesn't look like, like it can take off on its own, just uh, try to scoop them up if it's a smaller one, place it in a paper bag and call your nearest licensed rehabber. Uh, American Bird Conservancy is not a rehabber and we don't deal with, with uh, injured birds like that. But if you just do a quick Google search of your local DNR, they will have a list of licensed rehabbers in your area with phone numbers and you should be able to, to find someone that way that can give you a hand. Also, if you call your local vet, they should have this information as well. Thanks, Aniko. Brian, the next one is for you. So we're gonna talk more about solutions. There's lots of info on our website as we keep saying, but I want bird safe glass for my home. What does that mean? How do I do it? Tell me more. Un unfortunately, at the moment, um, it's very difficult to buy brand new bird safe windows for your home. Um, the size of the orders that those types of glass um, need to be purchased in um, is not something that the home window companies do. If you'd like them to, you know, I invite everybody here to start asking. Um, at the moment, we say buy whatever glass you want and then apply a retrofit and make sure there are screens on the outside. Um, and that will be effective. Um, and if you've got those screens that come up and down, that are multiples, you can put the screens on the outside. So when your storm windows are down in the winter, it's not all glass, the screen stays on the outside. So Brian, maybe you can uh, keep answering my next question and then the Nico, you jump in. But can you share a little bit more about the difference of outside the window options versus inside the window options? We're getting lots of questions, um, whether it's my apartment doesn't allow anything on the outside of my windows to I live in a high rise building and can't access the outside of my windows. So could you clarify a little bit about the difference of effectiveness as well as options? Sure. Um, the outside is always best because each surface of the glass has a reflection. And so if you've got something hanging on the inside, there's still a reflection in front of it. But if you put it on the outside, it's in front of the reflection and covers up the reflection and is going to be more visible. However, if you have windows you can't touch, you're not allowed to, or you're on the 30th floor, um, certainly trying something inside is better than doing nothing at all. Um, you can go outside, you can hang something up, go outside, take a look and see if you can see it. And if you can see it, there's a decent chance that for at least some parts of the day, the birds will too. Um, but if you're doing inside, you'd probably want a bolder solution. So, you know, if you're thinking like an eighth of an inch, a copium bird saver, you know, put something thicker than that if you're going to try it inside. So this is a great follow-up question too. So you mentioned about going outside, seeing if you can see the solution for yourself. When should you do that? The question is, I'm gonna follow your advice and start monitoring my windows. Um, what's the best time to do surveys for dead or injured birds that have collided with my building? Me again? <laughs> oh. yeah, <sure>. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, if you're gonna do the collision surveys to look for birds that have you know, collided and died, um, the best time is really early in the morning, you know, not at 3 a.m. early in the morning, thank God, um, but you know, 7, 8 a.m. and then maybe again later, a little bit later in the morning too, because um, that is the peak. But as Aniko mentioned, they do hit windows all day, so you could find them at any point. Um, and in terms of kind of testing the effectiveness of your solution and how visible it is, uh, it would be best to go out a couple times throughout the day and see how under different daylight conditions um, your solution looks. And one thing we talk about is, you know, if your windows reflect really dark trees and habitat, something that's white is probably going to show up better than something that's black. You know, think about it that way. Thanks. Chris, could you provide an update on our ABC's efforts to modify the LEED certification and our work with architects? People are interested well, in that aspect. We've been working with the Green Building Council um, since the 
lead credit for reducing bird collisions um, became official in 2011. Um, when, it's, when a credit is something called a pilot credit, um, you're allowed to modify it relatively simply, which we've done several times throughout the year. Um, and we've proposed one final modification, which is under review right now. Um, and once that happens, what we understand is that Green Building Council will make this credit part of their permanent library. Um, it's the, the most used pilot credit they've ever had. Um, and that is one way that we've gotten this message out to architects. Um, we also have continuing education classes, uh, several of them. Um, architects every year have to take uh, a number of classes to remain certified. Um, and especially with Zoom, we've been able to, to reach quite a lot of them. Um, we also uh, present papers at uh, conferences for the American Institute of Architects, for Green uh, Building Council and so forth. So um, we write about this and try to get it into architectural magazines. Um, we'll, we'll do anything that we can think of um, to try to get the word out there. Thanks so much, Chris. So Aniko, I have a question for you about bird feeders and habitat around my home. So how does that impact bird collisions? Am I creating more reflections? Should I make sure to put my bird feeders and not plant native plants around my house? How does, how does that all work? It's tough because you, you, most of us here really like birds. We want to attract them to our, our little garden oasises, o oasises. <laughs> but uh, the closer the feeder to the house, the better. Think of it this way, where it's lesser impact, say if they get um, confused and collide with the windows or if they're chased off the feeder by another bird, the closer the better. And um, the same with the native plants as well. You want them as close to your windows as possible to decrease any kind of impact. But the one thing I can preach, the whole reason we're here today, if you're going to be feeding birds, if you're going to be uh, uh, planting native plants, kudos to you, that's wonderful, but please make your windows bird friendly because collisions are going to happen no matter what. Thank you. Now I'm going to go back to Brian because I think Brian likes money and I think Brian wants money to help address this issue. Um, obviously, uh, this issue is something that we all need resources for. And a lot of folks are wondering, you know, how, how do I either get grants or can I apply for money to help my building? Um, let's, let's talk money. How, how does this all work, Brian? Um, right now, I'm not aware of any grant programs that cover this. Um, you might be able to do this with um, local small grants, um, depending on how much money you need and the size of the building you're after. Um, if you are a nonprofit, finding a donor is, is a good solution. Donors, if they have a favorite nature center, um, don't like the idea of their favorite nature center killing the nature. Um, so that can be a good solution. Um, a lot of the, the homeowner products and the things that Aniko covered um, aren't terribly expensive if you don't have a huge building. Um, so, you know, it can be put into like a facilities budget. Um, that was what Northwestern University did, that brief study I mentioned. Um, they just paid for it in their facilities budget for, for a year when they had a little extra. Um, so it's kind of just look, look everywhere and be in as inventive as you can be. Um, and keep fighting. <laughs> but it is true that paint is a more uh, cost-effective solution that could that even kids could take today, right? As Aniko yeah. shared. Yeah, so, paint and you know the acop the copium bird savers are basically ropes you hang in front of your window. Um, so if you're willing to go to the hardware store and buy a rope, you can make those pretty inexpensively and quickly. And actually, the Acopian website has instructions on how to make your own if you're interested in doing that. Thanks. So Chris, spring migration is coming. Literally billions of birds are going to fly across the US as they head north to their breeding grounds. Uh, I'm assuming that given the increase in individuals, the increase of collision events is going to happen, correct? Correct. The biggest peaks in collisions are spring and fall migration. And then can you share a little bit more about why those birds that fly at night tend to be the most frequent colliders? You mentioned warblers, thrushes, and sparrows. 
Is there any science that shares why those? Well, partly because they're the birds that are on the move. They're the birds that have to um, come down periodically. I mean, if, if you were gonna drive from New York to California, every so often you have to stop at a rest station. Well, birds have to do the same thing. Um, and just like you, you know, they go in to find food. So they're, they're flying at night, they're, they're coming down because they've done their stage. The sun comes up, they're looking for food um, and they're flying around, they're looking for vegetation because that's shorthand for food. Um, and they're finding reflections of vegetation right near the vegetation itself. So that's, that's why the collisions tend to happen in the daytime. And it's worth remembering that, that birds, you know, when we talk about dawn, birds actually sometimes um, can see dawn before we can. So they're active very early. Thanks, Chris. So unfortunately, our time is quickly coming to an end. So I'm gonna ask our last question of the webinar before we conclude. And that is, what is one thing you hope people take away from this webinar and share with a friend? And we're going to go in order of presenters. So Chris, if you want to start. I think the thing for everyone to remember is, is that this is one serious conservation issue that you can actually do something about. You know, you've listened to us today. And as Brian said, you can go home and fix your window right now. I mean, put post-it notes on the outside of your windows. That works. It doesn't have to be complicated or fancy. And Nico? I mean, same as, as Dr. Shepard, this is, this is an issue that everyone can address immediately. Uh, and you can pat yourself on the back for it too. Um, it's a really, really easy, easy thing to do to contribute back to nature and your birds. Uh, so yeah, just make one window bird friendly, like Brian said, a challenge. Brian. Well, I wish I didn't have to go last because I wrote down do a window with an exclamation point. Um, <laughs> I would, I would, I'll go say something else though. Uh, I would say get in front of the issue in your community. Instead of waiting for that building rendering to show up in the paper and going, oh my God, that's going to kill a lot of birds. Start now and try and get an ordinance passed that when you see that, you know, oh, they're going to have to do it bird friendly because four years ago we passed that ordinance. It will save you a lot of time in the long run and save a lot of birds. Thank you. Thank you to our expert speakers. Thank you to our amazing audience. Thank you for joining us. Um, we really couldn't do our work and help birds without your support. So thank you so much. And we hope that you take action today. Hi, everybody. Bye.